Amen. Amen and amen. Go and have a seat. Well, I'm Dave Householder, blessed to be your Bible teacher. And we're going to be looking at some matters of the heart today. We talked about, here's our heart, Lord. We were just singing that. And your heart is a lot more than we used to think it was a generation ago. It turns out that your heart is not just a pump. The ancients believed that the heart was the seat of emotion, the will, all those things. And it turns out they're probably right. Your heart produces more electricity than your brain. And your heart, electronically or electrically, will pick up the heart of another person at three feet. And you'll, they'll start to kind of communicate, and they affect each other's electrical field. In fact, when you hug somebody, it's your heart next to somebody else's heart. Who thinks it's important for a baby to be nestled close to our heart? When that doesn't happen, some bad things can happen. So we want to put our hearts out there. And once again, your heart is more than a pump. It's the seat of, in many ways, who you are. Our theme for 2024 is Launching Light, the book of John. Get the book of John out, if you would, and turn to John chapter 4, verses 1 and following. We have a new phrase in California, the atmospheric river. <laughs> it used to be just a lot of rain, but in California we tend to exaggerate a little bit. Uh, if it's going to be a rain, it's storm watch 2024, you know, or, atmospheric river coming our way. But I think they're right. Uh, Matt's back here somewhere. I saw him sitting in here, but Matt and I were out in the back here putting some security lights up this week, and there's a lot of water back there. It, this is a very flat piece of property, and it doesn't really drain really well at all. And we've had so much water at our house, and everything's just damp all the time. And we're going to talk about water today. We're going to talk about spiritual thirst. Who here has ever been through a dry spot spiritually where you just don't really hear from God, you don't really sense his presence, you're not hungry for his word? There's sort of a, a dull moment in our history with the Lord. And we go through those dry periods, much like we had here in California with the drought, we can go through a spiritual drought, and we need to be refreshed by the living water of the Holy Spirit. So my question for you today is, what hydrates your soul? Something the Lord showed me this week, I'm reading through the Bible bookmarks and all of the different ways we get into the Word, and something that really came to me, something I knew but didn't know, do you ever have things that you know, but you don't really engage them? The idea that all of our spiritual power and peace and joy comes from outside of us. Now, if you would have asked me that, check that box, is that true or false? I would have said true. But this week, I tried to generate myself a sense of well-being, and I couldn't do it. There are times where we can't, within ourselves, generate a good mood or a good state of mind. And the insight I got was that the best source for that, that good feeling, that sense of peace, that sense of shalom, is to receive it from the outside. Now, I know that that sounds really like a cliche, but it's really true. We can't generate our own joy not long term. We can bring it in from the outside. So we're going to talk about that today, and we're going to talk about the woman at the well from John 4. This is such a good passage, we're going to break it up into a couple, three spots, because there's too much in here to just skateboard over the whole thing. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. People were getting into a numbers game and comparing who was getting the biggest crowds. 
And who was the most popular? Who was getting the most likes on their Facebook page? Who was getting the most attention? And Jesus would have no part of it. Jesus wanted out. Didn't want to be a part of this John followers, Jesus followers. The Apostle Paul says that in 1 Corinthians. I'm so glad I didn't baptize a bunch of you because you're of Apollos, you're of Cephas, you're of Paul. No, we're all of Jesus. And all believers in Jesus share that common thing. So Jesus left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. We get so caught up with labels. And we have two churches worshiping together here in one family. We've got the well at Surf City. We've got Surf City Church. Our worship service we call Spirit Station. There have been labels for denominational affiliation. Uh, our church has had Lutheran affiliation, Curcio affiliation, Foursquare affiliation, all of that stuff. But those are labels. What do you think God sees when he looks down at his people worshiping? God sees one church. I'm not talking about here. I'm talking about everywhere. God sees one church of people who are faithful, faithfully following him and not really impressed with the labels. And neither was Jesus. In fact, Jesus said, I'm getting out of here. I don't want to take part in this sort of turf battle as to who's going to call people what and who's going to be in charge of that and who makes decisions for this. I don't want to be a part of this, so he got out. He removed himself from the situation. Now he had to go through Samaria. Let me give you just a little bit of geography. At the bottom of your map is Judea. The capital of Judea, or the tribe of Judah, is Jerusalem. Way up north, the top of your map, is Galilee. Galilee is where Jesus and his family, his father and mother and stuff, that's where they did business. And they probably went up there for work. It wasn't a Jewish area, per se. There's Jewish cities up there, but there's Greek cities up there. They went up there for work. My parents, my mother and father, both of their families went to Ketchikan, Alaska during World War II because that was very important for the defense of the United States at the time, and there were lots of jobs up there. So they went up to Ketchikan, Alaska, and my parents were raised in Ketchikan, Alaska, and they met there. I still think it was an arranged marriage because... The, my grandparents spent a lot of time together and hoped that nature would take its course, and it did. And I'm here because of it. So anyways, they went up north for work. And Jesus' family was from Bethlehem. And they went up north for work out of the Jewish homeland to Galilee, and they had to pass through Samaria. Samaria was enemy territory. People who saw themselves as faithful followers of the Lord, children of Jacob, children of Israel, but they blended in a bunch of other stuff with the faith. And so Jewish people saw them as sort of half okay. And you might think, well, how silly of them. But we've got our Samaritans too. We've got people who say, well, they're Christians, but not really the right kind of Christians, or they follow Jesus, or they believe in God, but not exactly the right way. And please hear me. I'm not trying to make us all Samaritans. That's not the point. But we, who thinks we can learn from how Jesus encountered a Samaritan? John Ellis is over here, and we laid his mother to rest yesterday. Thousand Oaks was the memorial service, and then we went to Forest Lawn for the interment ceremony, and his mother was a Mormon. And several of us here, uh, Linda was along, Harriet was along, a bunch of us, Wendy was along, we went along to support John, and I've never been to a Mormon service before. Never walked in to a Mormon local church. And I was nervous. I was really nervous on my way out. I thought, what's this going to be like? Is some kind of woo-woo, strange stuff? Are they going to, you know? I, I was concerned. But in many ways, aren't Mormons kind of like our Samaritans? They get a few things right, but there's a few things, you know. Please hear me. I'm not saying I want people to be Mormons or that Mormonism's great or that you want to be a Samaritan. I'm just saying, how do we work with people like that, work with them the way Jesus did? 
Pastor Anthony was here, was really good at working with the LDS church across the street. There are certain things we can do together, feeding the hungry, those kinds of things, making people prepared for earthquakes, helping people with that, things we can do together. I wouldn't want them to teach our Sunday school, but there's things we can do together. And how we treat Samaritans and how we operate with them, I think, is really important. So, he had to go through Samaria. He came to the town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. You're a Christian, and I'm a Mormon. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. We don't want to associate with whatever those people are, and fill in the blank. I would love to see America united again and not so polarized over every little issue. It's like we're choosing up teams, and if you're on the wrong team, people hate you. How you vote, how you, whether or not you got the vaccination, fill in the blank. I mean, there's, there's all, of this, all of this stuff. And people actually break fellowship over political things or theological differences. And we've got those differences in our families. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Women at the well... It's a big biblical deal. Zipporah, who was Moses' wife, Rebecca, married to Isaac, Rachel, married to Jacob, and they all met at the well. It's like the well was the singles bar back then. You know, they, they just all kind of, that's where marriage happened. So those of you who are single want to get married, just, you know, head for the nearest well and see what happens. But here they are. What's really interesting is on the mission field in Ethiopia, I've been there a couple times, and in the little villages, there's a key woman who's in charge of the well. And she has the key to the well, because it's usually locked. And women have, since time immemorial, been the people in charge of the well, which makes me nervous, because my church is called the well, and I'm supposed to be in charge, but maybe the women should be in charge. I, 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 I don't know. But in any case, it's very common for women to have authority over a well in a village throughout the world. And that was probably the case back then, too, because Jesus is asking her if he can, you know, here he's the son of God, may I please have a drink? Because he's recognized her as being the person at the well. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. By the way, I'm in charge of the well, so where are you going to get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Here you have Nicodemus 2.0. What did Jesus say to Nicodemus? You must be? And he gets confused and says, am I supposed to climb back inside of my mother and get born again? Jesus tells the Samaritan woman, how about some living water? And she says, well, how are you going to do that without a bucket? Both Nicodemus and the woman at the well misunderstood Jesus. They had a physical answer for a spiritual truth. And most of us would too. Most of us would do the same thing in that situation. Somebody says, I'm going to give you living water. You'd probably think, what a strange person. Uh, how are you going to do that? Or being born again, if you've heard that for the first time, you'd think that's quite strange too. But Jesus is sharing spiritual reality with people who are stuck in a physical world. And they're thinking physically. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them 
will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Once again, she's still thinking physically. If I get some of that living water, I'll never have to come and get any of this water again. I'll, I'll just be... What's really funny is the Germans came up with a word for this. They had a competition some years back. When you're hungry and you eat, you become what? Full. When you're thirsty, you drink. They didn't have a word for it, so they had a national competition. And the word they came up with was plip. And it, so now in German, you can say, Nein, danke, bin plip. So uh, I don't need anything else to drink. I've had enough to drink. So you'll always be plip, is what she's thinking. Now in Ezekiel 47, and you can look at this passage if you want to follow along. We're fixing the lights in here, by the way, so we're going to make it so that you can all read your Bibles better. That's coming. We've got a test light back there if you want to look at it. Ezekiel 47. There's the temple, and water starts to flow out of the temple. And it's just a little trickle. This is a vision that Ezekiel is having. Then it gets wider, and it's ankle deep. And then the river gets wider, and it's knee deep. And the river gets wider again, and it's getting to the point where you can barely touch the ground. And then the water gets even deeper in Ezekiel 47, and the man has to swim because he can't touch the bottom. And everywhere that river goes turns the desert into life. Life springs forth, animals, plants, all of these things. Now, the Jewish people back in the time of Jesus had a celebration called Sukkot. It was a harvest celebration, the Feast of Booths, they called it. And they would gather in Jerusalem. And all the guys with the big hats, you know, the priests and all those guys, would go down to the Pool of Siloam, and they had a golden uh, pitcher, and they would fill it with water from the Pool of Siloam, and they'd have a big parade up to the temple. And they would pour the water into a special spot at the temple, and they'd wait to see if the water would start to come like in Ezekiel 47. And it didn't, so they say, much like Minnesota Vikings fans, maybe next year, and they come back and do it again. So, literally, the parade is going on. This is in John 7. On the last and greatest day of the festival, this is when the parade is happening. This is when the priests have the water. This is when the people are cheering and they're going, maybe this year, maybe this year, the water will flow and the river will start and the desert will turn to life and that'll be great. Maybe it's this year and they're all cheering and everything else. And they're coming up here and Jesus stops the parade. Who thinks that might get you in trouble? Huntington Beach, by the way, you should all come to our house for the 4th of July parade every year. We love doing that. It's right on Main Street. And I think you could get in a lot of trouble stopping the parade. I think the helicopters would come for you, and the police would come for you, and the motorcycles and the whole thing, and you'd be asked to leave. Well, Jesus stops the parade right in the middle of the way up to the temple and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant whom? His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that point, the Spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. I'm going to give you a, a couple of Hebrew words. Mayim is water. Shamayim is heaven. Very similar words. Shamayim, if you want to break it down, basically means the sparkles on top of the water when the sun is setting or rising. And there's really nothing more beautiful than watching the sparkles on the water. And the sparkles on the water were the metaphor that the Jewish people used for heaven. It's something bright, something you can't touch, something you can't measure, something always a little bit out of our grasp, but is a part of 
everything. If water is the everything, the Shemayim is always there when the light of God shines on it. So that's sort of a, a metaphor for heaven. Heaven is that sparkly stuff around us that we don't really see with our physical eyes. Now, some of you have a gift of spiritually seeing things going, going on around you. And some of you might have had that when you were a child, seeing visions. Visions are a biblical thing. It doesn't make you crazy. You're not crazy if you see things from God. And very often we tell kids, oh, it's just your imagination. When God is giving them a vision, dreams and visions are really important things. I really hope that some of my dreams aren't visions because Andrew back there and I were fighting over a pizza in my dream two nights ago. And, uh, <laughs> And he was just being unreasonable. You know, he just, uh, 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 I'm thinking this is really not from God somehow. But, uh, so anyways, Mayim and Shemayim. Shemayim is probably what Jesus was talking about with living water. He wants to give us heaven. If you look at the Lord's Prayer, the very center of Jesus' teaching, the center of the Sermon on the Mount comes the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in Yeah as in heaven, so on earth, and wants to infuse heaven into our lives. And going back to what I said at the beginning, you and I can't generate heaven by thinking good thoughts. We have to bring in God's presence from the outside. We have to receive. The center of biblical spirituality is receptivity. It's all free. Jesus says, if you understood the gift I was giving, it's a gift to receive the Holy Spirit. There's nothing, it's like, I'm going to work really hard at being a Christian and maybe someday I'll get the Holy Spirit. No, the Holy Spirit is there for all of us all the time. Like that river that gets bigger and bigger and bigger as it goes. The Holy Spirit continues to bring life to his people. Emotional and spiritual hydration The hydration we need for our hearts, for our souls, comes from outside of us. And you're all here today because you want some of that living water. You could have been lots of other places, but you came here. Because you found, most of you, some of you are here for the first time, most of you have found living water in this place. You might find it during Holy Communion. We have a big, special Holy Communion the first Sunday of every month, but we have communion for people available every week. Who here has been surprised by the presence of God in Holy Communion? You're just kind of going through the post, you're, you're going through the motions, and next thing you know, Jesus shows up. And it comes from outside of us, and that's why communion is such a beautiful image of his gifts coming from the outside. We don't generate communion. Communion comes from the outside. The Holy Spirit comes from the outside. We want to receive him like living water because Jesus said the Holy Spirit is like living water. Let me give you some practicalities. Recognize your spiritual thirst. There's nothing wrong with being in a drought spiritually. But recognize it. And know where to go to have that living water fill you up. And don't just take a sip. I'm convinced my wife is dehydrated all the time. And she doesn't drink enough water. And she says, oh, I take lots of little sips. And I'm counting them, you know, making sure she's got all of it. I'm not really. But what I'm saying is just, just take a big drink of the Holy Spirit. Take a lot. Swim in that, lo- that river of life where you can't touch the bottom. You might say, well, I'm afraid, I'm afraid we might go off the deep end. Uh, way more churches go off the shallow end, and nobody complains. Think, think of all the churches that fall off the shallow end. We, we ought to be a little bit braver at connecting with the Holy Spirit and letting him do his thing. And we have to give up control for that to happen. And I don't know about you, but I don't like giving up control. I mean, I'm kind of nervous now because a lot of us are parking in a different place now that we're worshiping here. I'm used to seeing who's here by their cars, I can tell. You know, and all of a sudden people are parking in different places and it kind of upsets me. So... We need to be more open. We need to be more open to the Holy Spirit guiding our days and our lives. It's not about winning arguments. It's about letting him have control 
of our lives. Avoid emotional investment in religious labels for which God doesn't really care that much. Labels can divide the body of Christ. Now, I have some rather incurable Pentecostal tendencies. I love Holy Spirit stuff. I love to pray for people to get filled with the Holy Spirit. I love to see people operating in the spiritual gifts. But I can't stand it when Pentecostal Christians, and I suppose I am one, ask me, so, is he spirit-filled? Which is kind of a label. It, it's like there's people who are and people who aren't. And who are you to label all people like that? Truth is, nobody's a Christian who hasn't connected with the Holy Spirit somewhere. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Labels can really get in the way. Beware of false hydration, entertainment, scrolling on our phones all day long, chemicals and the abuse of chemicals, the abuse of food, overly recreating, recreating all the time. For me, I think that uh, food could easily fill that. Harriet didn't finish her pie yesterday at lunch, and I just helped her finish it, even though you know, I just volunteered. And I got on the scale, and I'm several pounds over where I was a couple weeks ago, and some people have an inner child. I've got an inner, inner sumo wrestler who wants to be fed right now. Feed me, feed me. And I could easily, I could easily have food be a substitute for the Holy Spirit. Easily. And I've got to make sure that doesn't happen. What's your substitute for the Holy Spirit? What's that thing that you use for hydration that's just false hydration? It's not the real thing. Now, there's nothing wrong with entertainment. There's nothing wrong with food. There's nothing wrong with responsible use of, of prescription drugs and whatever. And all of that's nothing wrong with recreation. But we can make all of those things that which hydrates us rather than the Holy Spirit himself. So we need to look at that and be honest. Come to the church, come to church for the Holy Spirit, not for something else. Not to make sure they sing our favorite songs, whatever that is. I hate to tell people this, but music is the most subjective thing there is. And if you don't believe me, go to a group of people and ask someone to play the music, and there will be, you know, yeah, I, I, in, I grew up in the 60s and the 70s, and Led Zeppelin is still in my head. I can't get it out. It's just in there. And we're all, they say sociologically, that the music we loved the most when we were 15 to 25 is the music we think is the best the rest of our life. And we tend to stick to it. And, yeah, man, just, yeah, that's when classic rock was classic rock. That's right. But people will never agree on that. They'll never agree on the color of the carpet. They'll never agree on a whole bunch of things. But that stuff is not what we want to be making the most important thing. We want Jesus to be the most important thing. Come to church for the Holy Spirit, not for something else. I saw a wonderful meme, and I put it up on our Facebook group. Um, I don't go to church to be entertained. I go to church to have an encounter with God. And that's what we're here for. And that's why you're here, to have an encounter with God. Don't leave here without it. If you have to come up here to the altar rail and just wait until he connects, do it. Stay hydrated every day. Sebastian, where's Sebastian? He's sitting over here. He put together a prayer journal, and I'm using it for Lent. I'm writing stuff in there because my prayer life had gotten really random, and I really wanted to get more focused and more disciplined. And it's really helped me because when you get into the Word every day, and we have new Bible bookmarks, right? Those are out there. Make sure you get those before you leave. Getting into the Word every day, it's like a splash of living water. And that living water can connect with us. I hope that you do stay hydrated every day. And when you start to feel dry, say, Lord, fill me up with your Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5, 18 and 19. Do not get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. I'm not sure exactly what debauchery is, but I don't want to have it. I just, it, it doesn't look like a good thing. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to
to one another with psalms, hymns, and spirit songs. Spirit songs are songs that we sing spontaneously that someone hasn't written before. Kim did a little bit of that today. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. I'm going to invite the worship team up. We're just going to pray for the Holy Spirit to come and for us to be receptive to his presence. And especially those of you who are going through a dry phase, I want to just invite you not to leave here until the Holy Spirit fills you. And the Holy Spirit will fill you. The Bible says, which among you parents would give a scorpion to a kid who asks for an egg? Nobody. How much more, Jesus says, will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to everyone who asks? The living water of the Holy Spirit. If you're receptive, the living water will flow. So it's a matter of, I think, opening ourselves up to his presence, opening ourselves up to his connection with us. If you're going through a hard time in life, this is the time to receive living water. Let's pray.